Ah, oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. From the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios, I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer. Matt Doyle, David Goss, we are but one day away from MLS games in CONCACAF Champions League. We're 12 days away from MLS opening day. We have a huge show for you on this Monday. John Arnold, the king of CONCACAF. He's going to preview CCL with us. Why this is the year for an MLS team, and no, we're not just yanking your chain again. Robin Frazier talking Rapids. Wilfred Nance talking Montreal. We'll also preview NYCFC. We will go through the big trades that happened in Major League Soccer since last Thursday. We'll rank our number 10s, and there is much disagreement, and we'll hit a little Minnesota United in the mailbag. What's up, guys? How you doing? How you feeling just one day till CCL? Do you have that pit in your stomach? Are you prepared? Do you feel the pain already, or is it starting to just sort of wash over you? I I don't I do not feel prepared, um, but I am weirdly looking forward to it, and I don't know uh, whether like I might be sick. I don't I don't know why I, I have uh, I, I I'm looking forward to what is uh, our annual gauntlet of misery, um, but like I I think it's just like. I like all five teams, all five MLS teams that are in CCL this year. You know, five very good coaches, five very good rosters, uh, kind of like opposite ends of the spectrum in some to some degree, uh, where it's like the you know Montreal and, and Colorado maybe punching above their weight, and uh, Seattle and New England and NYCFC are three of the yeah I don't want to say the biggest spending, but like they're, they're you know veteran heavy rosters and that kind of know-how so it's it's like i'm real look I, i'm not gonna say what you said i'm not gonna say this is the year we'll talk to john arnold about <laughs> we'll that. let john say that john says he might say that so we're gonna try to bait but, him into it but between thinking that the mls teams that are in it this year are really good and really well equipped to compete and the fact talk that yourself into it yeah there's uh-huh. no tigris there's no tigris there's no monterey um cl- there's no club america mm like that, that checks like that checks and back. That said, Cruz Azul right now is a wagon. You know they they are up to I think second in Liga MX. We know what they did last year during the Clausura. Um, they've won this title before, so the, Cruz Azul are still the favorite. But, um, but that's a wagon like, destined for those wheels to fall off. If history tells oh, us anything. Wow. I'm Cruz just saying. Cruz has been fine in, ah, in CCL. Sure, they just, sure. They broke their 20-year drought last year. Anyway, I just want to make the case again for you to add Anders to the partners in soccer list. I, I think you're snubbing him every time you open the show. Okay, Weeby? So there you All go. All right. I, I forgot to do it. I'll do it next time. I promise you. Mm-hmm. Dave, we, we will get your what CCL thoughts here in a little bit. That was a lot to digest yeah, from we started Doyle. In yeah, CCL that was like a roller coaster. It was like Doyle saying... I just want to state my one simple point about Anders after five minutes of talking about CCL. Yeah, he was like, I had no journey, idea. Man. I started talking. I had no idea where it was going. He was, he was like looking over the edge of a cliff. He's like, am I going to jump? Am I not going to jump? I've got the parachute on, but like in this competition, the parachute never pulls for me. Anyway, there are games coming up tomorrow. Watch those. We'll have fun doing so with you. Well, will MLS After Dark on Twitter. I'm sure we'll go down. Uh, check it on the call up as well. I told you to go listen to that Miles Robinson interview uh, from the other week. That's really good. I think they have Gianluca Busio coming up as well. So check it on that one. I just want to tell you and tease here, there will be an additional, unless something crazy happens and it blows up in our faces, there will be an additional podcast this week. So check your feed. One Josie Altador will join us. So that ought to be real interesting. This morning, the announcement in New England, Josie, part of the Rebs. Uh, Complete buyout of his contract from Toronto FC. He'll sign that three-year TAM deal with the New England Revolution. We all knew it was coming. It has now happened. He was posting this weekend snowy shots from Foxborough in the training ground. So There's only one thing Josie wants left in his career, and it's a CCL spot. And if Toronto FC is not in it, then he's got to go to the Revs for a chance to win CCL. Josie knows. Exactly. It's not about the World Cup. It's not about winning it. You know, not about getting back. It's about CCL. That's it. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. He's got that know-how. He almost got it done. Maybe he can get it done this time. Uh, All right, let's talk MLS news. Then we'll get into the bevy of content that we have for you on this Monday, Valentine's Day, by the way. Can I say, is? can we curse in Spanish on this show? Is that allowed? What do you think? I do not think we should. We don't. We shouldn't. I thought you were going to say happy Valentine's Day to us. That that was I already said it. I said it to Roger Espinoza. So I've already checked all my boxes on that front. I mean, I like you guys. You're my partners in soccer, but 
you know, there's, you know, there's less love than there is for me and Roger. But Miguel Angel Ramirez had no love for the moves that, uh, well, that Charlotte FC did not happen to make. A lot of stuff blew up in their face last week. A whole lot of stuff. So uh, Nick Kelly, the CEO of Tepper Entertainment, who was the CEO of Charlotte and then was then promoted, tweeted this out. Tough few weeks for DPs with the fans, coaches, and front office. So he says they were outbid for a domestic winger that we couldn't justify matching in any scenario. That was Paul Areola. You don't think that was Corey Baird? You don't uh, think they went back in for Corey Baird? Uh, I'm going to doubt. But I would just throw it out there that you know Tom Boger reported that they bid 1.8, and he ended up going for like two plus incentives. So I, there's a scenario in which I think you should certainly justify if you're Charlotte, especially now, having made that spend, especially when you got a million for Riley McGree off a player that never even came to your club in game, I should say. Yeah. So I could argue they could have justified that spend. Swiderski, Carl Swiderski joins the club. He's the DP9. Then they agreed to terms of the winger. He got hurt the next day. Tom Boga reported that was uh, Derby County and Poland international winger. He's a 23-year-old. Uh, Camille Joswiak, I think. So they would have had two Poland 20, players, internationals. Five caps with the Poland national team already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. But in about 20 appearances this year, just one, one assist, no goals for Derby County. So he wasn't exactly tearing it up Johnny Russell style in the Champo. But that didn't happen. He hurt his ankle, like real bad apparently. So that deal off. And then the Darwin Machis news, off for legal issues in Spain. And then Miguel Angel Ramirez got in front of, oh, got in front of uh, the media. And again, we can't curse, but he said in Spanish at the end of sort of a long sojourn about what was happening with them, or shall I say was not going to happen with them, we are screwed. <laughs> Native Spanish speakers got in the mentions and said, well, screwed is not exactly the word that we would use for this translation. It would more be like we were, we're trucked. We are trucked. <laughs> uh, th this is a turn of events here. This is a lot to take in. And certainly MLS Twitter and myself had a lot of fun with the phrase. W what do you think, Doyle? You had a little laugh there. This is a hell of a quote. This is a perfect quote. This is an amazing quote. This is, it, it just made my day. It, 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 it was an admirable amount of honesty. Um, it seems like a coach sending a very clear message to his front office uh, about what he wants on the roster. And it happened with the, the Machis deal falling through at the last minute. And I assume that had something to do with it. Uh, you know, this, this roster on paper, this isn't FC Cincinnati. You know, this isn't even Minnesota United, and we all laugh at Minnesota United because their defense was so bad, but that team ended up on like 35, 36 points, which is a totally fine debut season, totally fine expansion season. This team on paper looks like they have, a, I think, two or three Ecuador internationals in central midfield. They have the playmaker that, that uh, Ramirez wanted uh, from, from Tijuana, who was with him at Independiente de Valle. Uh, they have a $5 million DP center forward, which, you know, maybe that means something, maybe it doesn't. But, like, on paper, it does not look as bad as what he had to say. Um, at the same time, I'm not looking at this expecting an Atlanta United or LAFC style debut season. Um, so, in, like on the whole, it feels like him just sending a, a message to his uh, to his front office saying, "Go get me a ten million dollar player. Get me a high level attacking guy who we know is going to put the ball in the net fifteen times, um, and you know then then we'll be cooking." Um, but I like the fact that he's willing to go out there in the way he did uh, because it makes for really wonderful content. Just oh. absolutely amazing content. And, and, and Doyle mentioned that $10 million player. You look at two teams recently, look at LAFC, and they signed Carlos Vela before they had a crest, I think. Right? Like that was so far early. And then they loaned him out and went through the whole process. And the team was built around him. And that was successful for them. Then you look at Austin FC last year, and I think they kind of had a they, – they brought in some quality players and signed Cecilia Dominguez and those guys, but Jurisi was, let's see where the market's at and then bring him in. And it was a really tough year for them. And I, I've i been, I think, somewhat complimentary of Charlotte FC for maintaining flexibility and sort of reacting to the market in finding these big players. But I think if you're the coach, you want the Carlos Vela situation – 
where you have your guy that you are building around that's locked in, and then you can put pieces around that. And as Doyle said, Charlotte has built a spine. They they haven't just gone and pulled her in in pieces. But if you're the coach, I think you want your star player to be a piece of your team the whole year. And I think this shows the pressure in MLS. I think you look at a coach in Miguel Angel Ramirez that comes to this league from Brazil and from Ecuador and looks at Tata and looks at Guillermo Barascoloto and looks at the coaches, Almeida, that have come from South America up at Heinze last year and understands, like, I need to put a, a flag out there saying, if we're not the best team in the East two months in, this is why it's not just on me. And I think that's a change in MLS. Look, Charlotte, the thing I'll say, Charlotte had a lot of time. This is not like a slow, like a, hey, hey, we got like, you know, oh my God, they advanced our expansion season ahead and we, we have eight months to build a squad. What do we do? How are we going to do it? It's a panicked rush. Like that, that was not the situation for Charlotte. Like they've had, they've had members of their sporting staff be hired two years ago and already have left yeah. before they even kicked the ball. They had a lot of time, and that's where I think and, – and Angel Ramirez has been around for a while. That's where I think the frustration comes from. It's like, man, we had all this time, and it seemingly we had our ducks in a row, but we were leaving it a little bit late, and you got to say they were leaving it a little bit late here, and now it's blown up in our faces a little bit because that, that's what's happened. Just, Things out of their control, an injury, et cetera, but like, yeah, there was time. There was time, and I think that's why he's frustrated. I, I agree with you 100%, and I just want to say the fact that you did not botch that ducks in a row metaphor is just like, uh. you have used preseason well, you're getting into game shape. I, oh. I, like As soon as you started saying it, I was like, oh, where is this going? Where is this going? And yeah. you, like, you brought it home. That was a big moment, man. A huge moment for me. Massive moment for me. Charlotte FC fans, let us know what you think. Uh, you're in D.C. to start your season, then you're at home against the Galaxy. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what's this? Are you, in fact, screwed? Do you think you're screwed? Does it matter to you? Or is this just a party for you? 401-206-0MLS. Extra time at MLSsoccer.com. They're not screwed. You don't think they're, so? They're, gonna I, be, they're, they're, gonna, they're not going to be as good as Nashville were. They're not going to be as, as disastrous as Miami or uh, Cincy were. Uh, but, like, I, I, I see them in, like, that Austin, Minnesota United level where it's like, ooh, they clearly got some stuff wrong. But like this can be fixed. It's not going to be a five-year, you know, ordeal. Try like they, look at those guys on that roster. Like they have some players on that roster. They're they going to be pretty okay. They don't have wingers. They just don't. Just going to say. Yeah, that's fair. That's they don't fair. have. Them. All right, let's uh, quickly hit some other news here. Ryan Hollingshead for Marco Farfan. Straight swap. FC Dallas sending their long tenured left back to LAFC. Well, for LAFs, for a 23-year-old who's got about 65 MLS appearances, most of MLS Twitter, Dave, said, wow, LAFC fleeced them. What a deal for LAFC. What are Dallas doing? How did you interpret this one? I think I've said it on the show. I'm a big fan of Brian Hollingshead as a player. Um, he can do so many things for your team. He's versatile, which I think helps that LAFC team. It's been made fairly evident that he did not want to be in Dallas. And I don't think it's ridiculous for Dallas to look at it and say, yeah, you don't really fit our timeline. We're a younger team, and he is a leader in that group, and I think he's had a really big role over the last few years. Um, but there's nothing you can do about it. You're, you're either going to lose a guy for nothing, and that's the addition of free agency in MLS, or not. And so they went out and they got Farfan, who I think will be a starter in MLS in his career. I, I think he has the capability of doing it. I liked it when LAFC picked him up. Um, he's probably not there today, but Dallas is a team that's going to give you time to develop and give you space to do it. So it's definitely a loss for Dallas, but you have no choice and you got to get something back when you can. It's a huge addition for LAFC. I've been doing some reporting on the back end because this is a very interesting one, a lot of opinions on this. And I'm not sure the situation was necessarily that Hollingshead is saying, get rid of me, I have to go. But he had a year left on his deal. He's a California guy. He's long sort of been... You know, we had him on this show, and he's like, yeah, man, Sacramento would be awesome. But he's from soccer, Northern California. In the whole world of soccer, that's how that works, right? With right. pre-contract, obviously you don't sign pre-contracts in MLS. But with pre-contracts, you don't let a player get to their last year. A last year is they're gone. So that is, for everyone out there to think about Correct. it, that is how you have to process it from here on out. Now that free agency is a legitimate avenue for many players to enter. Yeah, and look, last year, what was the issue with Dallas? There was the back line. 
Ryan Hollingshead is an amazing attacking fullback in MLS. I would not say he's like a, hey, stay home and, and put def- defense first. Whereas I think Dallas this year, they're like, hey, we'll attack with four or five. We'll have Velasco on the left. They're shown. They need protection. Marco Farfan, more of a stay-at-home guy. I think it made sense for both teams. I think it's hard for Dallas fans to see Hollingshead go. But I think that difficulty has to be made a little bit better by seeing FC Dallas basically do right by him in the sense that he wanted to be in L.A. Yeah. He has a, a young kid like, hey, I, I want I would like to be in California if I'm going to move. And Dallas saying, well, we can't really lose you for free. You can argue about the value they got, but we'll, we'll see on Marco Farfan. I just want to say Nico Estevez called in Marco Farfan or helped call him in to a national team camp about a year and a half ago. So it's not like he doesn't know the dude. And certainly he has a different idea about the way this team is going to play than it has in the past. So, uh, yeah, TBD on that one, but congratulations to Hollingshead and his family for getting back home. He's, he played at UCLA. He's got a young child. Like This this makes sense in a lot of ways. Uh, Kate Cal signed a U22 deal, but Doyle, I want to ask you about this uh, reported deal from Tom Bogert. It says, Jamiro Montero from the Union to San Jose for 250 k in GAM international slot and 200 k GAM incentives. So sounds like up to 700 k in GAM. Mm-hmm. You like it? Yeah. What do you think? I, I, I think I like it for both teams. Um, for Philadelphia, like obviously Montero was deemed surplus to their needs. Uh, they went out. They got a DP10 last year, a guy who plays the same position that Montero does. They have in Paxton Aronson and uh, McGlynn and uh, maybe even Quinn Sullivan, three highly rated uh, academy prospects who – play that position as well um montero what has not been as good the past two years as he was in 2019 and there were some locker room things with him you know he 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 was not a beloved guy in that locker room uh san jose gets to buy low on him they have an open dp slot they have you know chris leach has been doing a lot of work acquiring guys from within mls i think he fits really snugly if he's bought in with Judson and Jackson Yule in a three-man central midfield in a very simple 4-2-3-1. You know that Montero is going to take some stuff off the table with his shot pass decision making. He, If he's on the ball within 30 yards and he does not see an immediate outlet, he will launch and it'll go into the stands and that's frustrating. But he brings... He put so much back on the table with his ball winning ability, with his ability to cycle possession um, in the build out and and his confidence. Like that first year or even 18 months with Philly, his confidence was, I think, infectious for that team. I think that'll work with San Jose. And at the same time, it's not a long term commitment. It's a one year flyer on a DP for a team that has already done a fair bit of rebuilding this offseason and I think, frankly, is kind of headed to a new era in this in the sense that I'm pretty sure this is going to be Matias Almeida's last year. Like, and so this is like a, a bridge signing to whatever comes in 2023. They didn't have to spend a lot for it. He's a good player. He should help. It checks a lot of boxes for both teams. Yes, it does. Uh, Sebastian Blanco, by the way, two-year deal to the Portland Timbers. Second is an option, so if things don't work out with the knee or whatever happens here, they could get out of it, but you know, we'll see how happens there. Uh, Andy Polo, contract canceled, terminated. Go read about this. The Athletics has reported on it extensively. Uh, domestic uh, violence issues for Andy Polo, uh, and that's you know all I have to say about that. Contract gone, as it should be. So uh, we'll see what else happens with Andy Polo there. Dom Dwyer on trial in Atlanta. Luca martinez Dupuy, a uh, youth international at Mexico. He's also at Rosario Central. Is rumored to be on his way to back up Joseph Martinez and provide competition there. Those seem like uh, interesting potential moves. Dom Dwyer, uh, TBD. And then you know a, a 21-year-old or 20-year-old uh, Mexico international who has been scoring goals in the first division in Argentina. That seems like a good player to have behind Joseph just in case something happens. But uh, no CCL for Atlanta this year, so they'll have to wait till February 26th to see how all that shakes out. Let's talk CCL with John Arnold. Get conky capped. John, what's up, man? How you doing? Oh, man, it's going great. Be even better if I was back in Kansas City's finest, but hopefully soon. Uh, we will see you back here very, very soon. But not for CONCACAF Champions League. Not this year. 
Uh, get CONCACAFed. Make sure you do that. Subscribe to the newsletter. I, I think you should pay for it. I pay for it. I, I enjoy paying for it. Every dollar is uh, is worth it. So go follow John on Twitter and get that in your inbox uh, a couple times a week. John, tell us what you think about CCL right now from an MLS perspective. Is this the year? Could it be the year? Yeah, I mean, that's the question we're always asking, right? But generally, I'm the guy who kind of reigns on the parades. But this year, I'm the guy who uh, brings out the sunshine, I guess, because I actually think it looks great for MLS teams this year. You know, the big question is, can you beat Mexico? Um, The Mexican teams are always better. They've won every single edition of this tournament since the, the, the relaunch. But you look at the crop of Mexican teams this year, and then you look at the crop of MLS teams, and I think the MLS teams generally, now we haven't seen them play yet, but I think the MLS teams generally can be in better form. I think they can claim to be sort of better constructed. And when you look at the Mexican teams, the way they've started their domestic season, uh, even some of the absences that, that have you know, occurred or the, the transfers that have happened to a lot of these teams, you're looking at a crop of teams that I think is much weaker than than in the past. You know, some of that is just down to big names. You mentioned, hey, no no CCL in Kansas City this year. Well, no CCL in Monterrey, right? There's no Rayados, no Tigres, just because of the nature of who qualified for this tournament. America isn't in it. Still action in, in Mexico City with Cruz Azul and Pumas. But You know, some of those big names, big spending teams just simply didn't qualify for this tournament. But then you get in deeper and you say, well, how is Santos Laguna doing? How is Leon doing? These are teams that have been consistently great the past several seasons. Santos hasn't won a single game out of five. They let uh, Guillermo Armada, their manager, go to Pachuca in the offseason, tried to rerun things with Pedro Caixinha, and they haven't looked good at all. They're they're 0 for 5. They're sitting last in Liga Mekis. Leon doesn't look as good as they have in the past. And Cruz Azul, they're sitting third in the table right now. But at the same time, there's this kind of institutional crisis that you can read about in this week's uh, premium edition of the newsletter on Mexico Monday. Sporting director left. Will Juan Reynoso, this manager who had the magic touch, who got them to this title for the first time since 1997 last year, who got them back into the CONCACAF Champions League. Will he leave? That's what every fan of La Máquina is, is, is having nightmares about right now. So they could be in a different situation as soon as, you know, their first game against the MLS team. So that leaves Pumas flying the flag. Maybe, you know, Cruz Azul could bounce up. Santos Laguna could bounce up. Leon could bounce up. But I think MLS has a real reason to not just believe, but aim for this season to be the one where they win the CONCACAF Champions League. Mm. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, the hope runs through us, and it might be extinguished very, very soon. The only MLS team with a uh, Liga MX matchup in the round of 16 is Montreal. They have Santos Laguna. Uh, if you, I just want to throw out the Eddie Sabrango reference right now. Just get it out of the way. <laughs> Cross that one off the list. Almost a famous result back in the USL days for what was then the impact. If you had to put your money on one MLS team to say, I think this is the team that has the pathway, that has the talent, that has the wherewithal to actually make history, who would you be looking at? Yeah, I, I think the Sounders, although their path is not the easiest, I think the Sounders, you know, you look at their roster construction, you look at what they've done. Sure, sometimes it takes them a while to get started, but I think Motagua could be a feisty out, but at the same time, I think they can they can get past. And then you're looking at probably Leon in the next round. Well, we've already seen MLS teams get one over on Leon in CCL, even when Leon is in great form. And, and right now, like I said, they're just not putting it together. That could absolutely change in a month or two. But when I look at the Sounders kind of combining their strengths with their potential opponent's weaknesses, uh, I think that's the matchup where I really look at it. The other one that, that could be a bit surprising is the Rapids because, you know, I think they'll get past Comunicaciones. They've got some vaccine compatibility issues getting into the U.S., so they probably won't bring their biggest team. I think it'll be a a somewhat straightforward tie for the Rapids, and then they're probably playing New York City FC. Santos of Costa Rica also having a few uh, players unable to travel because of a weird situation that's happening in Costa Rican domestic soccer right now. Again, it's in the newsletter. But uh, I, I think when you, you know, whoever comes out of that tie, obviously you play another MLS team, the pathway is there. So that would be kind of my auxiliary pick. But to kind of go bold, I think the Sounders have a good matchup if they, they end up facing Leon. And then the path is certainly there to at least make the final. Uh, let me ask you this, John. Uh, on last week's show, David Goss guaranteed that the New England Revolution are going to win. CONCACAF Champions League this year. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how crazy is that? I'll go with an 8. 
th- yeah. their path could be there too. But at the same mm-hmm. time, their team is quite different, as as you guys know. It looks like they might get a bye into the next round. Unfortunately, I'd love to see them play against a Haitian team in, in Cavalry, but it doesn't seem like they're going to be able to get into the U.S. Hopefully they get their visas. Hopefully that gets sorted. So the first step of CCL is quite easy. But then after that, I mean, I, I think it gets tough. Pumas, you know, they're this team that, and, and look, Saprisa could get through as well from that tie. But Pumas is a team that historically, you know, we know them, we love them, cool jerseys, et cetera, et cetera. Right now they're struggling with budget, but at the same time, uh, they're also doing quite well. They're, they're, the attack is looking good. Andres Alini, the manager, is, is a bit of a... I don't know what a great MLS comparison would be. You know, who's a guy who actually plays some fun soccer and gets way more out of his team than maybe an Oscar Pereja type, you know, kind of pragmatic, gets the best out of out of his pieces. But then now and then you'll see him take the reins off and the team is actually fun to watch. So maybe that's a, a kind of comparison if you've only watched MLS, you know, but th- their manager is so good. It'll be a fascinating one, him against Bruce, if, if we get there. But I don't think the Revs have the best path and I don't think they have the best team. I What's going say, down with Cavalli? Can I just ask that? Like, wait, we, just, before we do that, I just want to say, Doyle, I'm upset with you for trolling me, but I thought that that <laughs> was really mature of you to use someone else as a teammate to give them the assist to troll me and not you do it yourself. So wait a I minute. Growth. You, he's Valderrama. He's Valderrama. He's, he's a past first troller. Fact. All I did was state the fact. <laughs> you it. said on last week's show that the Revs were going to win. The Revs would win like, a trophy me. and they wouldn't win Supporter Shield. And then everyone said, what, MLS Cup? And I said, I don't know, CCL. And then I get a bunch of texts two days later saying, uh-huh. nice, dude. I'm glad you picked the Revs to win CCL. And I don't even think that's what I said. They have, but when they have they do CCL it, legend. They have CCL legend Josie Altador now. Yeah, they do. Exactly. They do. Sounds like you need to choose your words better, Dave. That's what it sounds like mm-hmm. to me. I'm going to go over here. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Cavalli. What's what's going on with Cavalli? Like, it was already going to be two games in, in New England, John. But it, yeah. now we're talking about there just not even being uh, any of these games? I think it's a big shame because I, I've, I've been speaking with a lot of people in Haiti and, and also in Southern Florida uh, that are involved with the club in the past week. You know, this is actually, I think it's easy to sort of say, ah, the Caribbean, there's no history there. This is a team that was founded in the 1970s that has a lot of players developed, including current uh, Haiti national team manager, uh, Jean-Jacques Pierre. Uh, Pierre and uh, you know he developed there there's other guys who developed there that have been Haitian uh, national team players so this is like a legitimate club but it, everything is tough in Haiti right now including getting visas to travel the US embassy is operating at you know some skeleton crew because of the difficulties that Haiti has had politically um, safety wise it's just not a good situation right now um, but everything that I've heard and of course these are generally people that are connected with the team although not always um, everything I've heard is that they've been trying for, for weeks and weeks to get the proper visas to get into the country they've done their COVID testing they got the guys vaccinated that, that needs to you know co- you know, all the requirements are, are being taken care of except for that visa CONCACAF is trying to help the revs are trying to help some of the you know Haitian government officials are trying to help uh, but right now the game is postponed it's Monday as we're speaking right now. And what I'm hearing is if they don't travel by Wednesday, it's going to have to be a forfeit. Unfortunately, they looked at moving the game. They looked at doing other things. Uh, but unfortunately, it just seems like that's the situation right now. I've had a couple people try and compare it to past kind of tough CONCACAF travel situations where the game still went ahead. Last year, Alec Lense that traveled uh, despite missing guys because of... Um, the COVID waiver, if you remember those fun days where, you know, athletes could come in, even if they had been in one of the red zone countries in the last 14 days. I'm glad those days are behind us. But it's not really the same situation because in Haiti, the embassy is basically closed right now. And these guys have been trying and trying and trying. Last year, CONCACAF said that the Alhulense guys, uh, the directors and everything, tried to get that waiver the day of travel. And that was never going to happen. So I think the situations are different. And from what I can tell and from what I'm being told, the Haitian team is trying to do everything to get to New England. They're doing everything right. But the circumstances are kind of out of everyone's control, it seems like. So fingers crossed they get there. You know, we talk about two road games because they're both at Gillette. But uh, Boston actually home to an enormous Haitian uh, community, uh, third largest after New York and Miami. So there were going to be some fans there rooting for the Red Horse, as they're known. I'd love to see him get there. And, and who knows what could happen, of course, against the Revs if the games get played. The Revs will get through. That's just the nature of the game right now. But it'd be good to see the games actually happen. So fingers crossed. And I have to say, 
More on that in the newsletter as well. Oh, God. What a, just an elite <laughs> plug. Nobody plugs oh, like boy. John. Me and him just <laughs> passing it back and forth, going straight to goal. Uh, follow him on Twitter. Go subscribe to the newsletter. Seriously, it is an amazing way to keep up with the region. John, we appreciate your time, man. My pleasure, guys. We'll talk through the next rounds and uh, the entire tournament. We'll see if those revs win, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Big thanks to John. We have a little bit of time here that Andre says we don't have, Dave. So that is where you get to talk about Hamilton Forge and CCL. Give us the rundown for the CPL representatives. Weeby, come on, bro. You don't say the Hamilton. It's just Forge. Sorry, FC. sorry, my bad. Know the lingo, dude. Oh, Be cool. Geez, this yeah. is why no one gives you I know, you I know. They're like, oh, I, I thought you were cool. All identity. the people above the border are like, I knew it. I knew that Weeby guy <laughs> wasn't really about it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think John gave the breakdown, which is Cruz Azul are the best League MX team coming into CCL right now. So it's the worst matchup Forge could have gotten. And obviously, no CPL team having history in this competition. They're always going to get a tough draw. Uh, they could be fun. They are a team that has shown in their CONCACAF experience, as well as in Canadian Championship, that they can dominate the ball in Canadian, in CPL play, but then sit deeper and, and hit on the break against big teams when they have to travel, they lost the CPL final to Pacific and then went and signed Pacific's leading striker and then the goal scorer of the game winning goal in the CPL final. It was a very heavy flex move. And so they've got good young attacking pieces. The best goalkeeper in the league, Kyle Becker, obviously, as the metronome oh, in midfield. Yeah. And Ashton Morgan Legend. now has been signed up to, uh, to play. So it, it's going to be fun. They, they're by far the best team in CPL even though Pacific won the title last year, and I think they're going to be frisky. Do you have a, a CCL take, Doyle, that you can uh, usher us out and into the uh, team previews on? Like you, you basically said in the break, and I don't know if you said it on, on record, that you'd be an insane person yeah. to guarantee that an MLS team would win this thing. Yeah, it's like, it's like crazy talk to ever guarantee an MLS team would win uh, CCL the way that David Goss guaranteed that the New England Revolution will win this year. That's my take. All right, that's your take. All Listen, right. <laughs> based off Pixar movies I've seen, if you have no hope, are you even really a person? Mm, that's fair. That's fair. I am not. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I don't. I'm trying to. I've watched a lot of Pixar lately, and I'm trying to figure out where that fits in. Is that like a Wally reference? I don't know. But let's. No. What's the one with Amy Poehler where they're in the brain? I just guessed that. Uh, okay. That one. Uh, I bet you I could find something. I don't remember what that one's called. We've watched it though. God knows we've watched it. I won't make this any. This is an Encanto. Guy uh, I was right just gonna here. say I won't make any Encanto references here. All right, let's talk about uh, New York City FC. Here is the haiku from 2021. Need more, says Dyla. You remember at the time he was asking for more players, better players. Good hasn't been good enough. Where do, uh, what do they stand for? I think we, we basically found that out. So in 2022, got more. Got the cup. Put some respect on their name now. About Tati. So look, the put some respect in your name is a shout to Jonathan Sanchez, who has not stopped saying that in my mentions for the better part of two and a half years, it feels like. Uh, and, but the big question, I think, for them is what's going to happen with Tati? Like, sort of the rest of it, Doyle, feels pretty fleshed out. Feels pretty settled. They went and got more. They went and got the three young South American players who look like they have huge upside. But Tati is their talisman. He's sort of the guy. And, like, if you're going through a full season, you know, they could do it against Philly in the playoffs, but in CCL and a full season MLS, that does change things, even though a bear is a nice backup option to have, and maybe Tyus Magno could fit into that position. What is 2022 for NYCFC in your mind? Uh, I think it, you we're going to break it down into two halves. The first half is about winning CCL. This team has, I think, the best shot of any of the MLS teams, um, and in large part, it's because they kept Tati. They kept, mo what, 10 of 11 starters from last season's MLS Cup win. And, like, th they'll miss James Sands, but they showed last year for good chunks of time that they can play without James Sands. Uh, they got a DP center back, which was uh, sort of – like the the area of biggest need. They have all those reinforcements that Ronnie Dylo was, was complaining about not having this time last year. They have those guys with a year under their belt. Um, and they're keeping Tati until midseason, it looks. And that's great. And I think they have a real shot at winning. So get to, you know, hopefully, you know, get to the Club World Cup. That's the first half of the season. Sell Tati for $20 million. That's the, the summer window. And from there, I think it's a, 
about it's less about the shield um though they'll be competitive and more about gearing up for another mls cup run because like they're like they've shown over the past few years they can develop players man ronnie tyler's done a really good job of it um and now they can win trophies too and when you have those two things and a budget you're going to be a tough out every single game and I, uh, to me, I agree with everything Doyle said, but I'd add in that second half of the season, it is um, showing the, the pipeline that the club will be in. They've shown they could bring homegrowns through and sell them. Tati is going to be the first foreign player, young foreign player, big money sale. And I think for the identity NYCFC looks like they want to have, should have and can have, they then have to show the next step. How do you tell Uruguayan, Argentine, Brazilian, Ecuadorian, Colombian players. Look, Santi Rodriguez is the best winger on our team. You're going to come in, and this this is the steps. This is the process, right? Tati came in. He played on the wing. Then we moved him to center forward. He won Golden Boot. We sold him. Santi Rodriguez came in, played on the wing, played well in the playoffs, dominated the next year. Then we had the process to selling him, and you're the next piece. And that's what NYCFC is putting together, I think that's what they can show this year that they're capable of doing while continuing to win and be competitive. Yeah, I agree. It's the Santi Rodriguez's, it's the Tyus Magno's, it's the Andrade's. Like, if Tati's gone, well, you need to have that success succession plan, and those guys are that plan, it seems like. Uh, right now, I just want to say, Keaton Parks, I've not seen him in a yeah, preseason that's a 11. Yeah, mark about CCL. Um, so that's a TBD, but when you look at the path for them, I mean, and John sort of said it, and we've said it, NYCFC has Santos, then they'll have either Comunicaciones or Rapids, and then, only then in the semi finals would they potentially meet a Liga MX team and they might not because Seattle Sounders might knock off Club Leon and then Sounders are no easy out either but it's like if you if you don't play a Liga MX team you can't lose to them like that's <laughs> sort of like that's the CCL logic that you that need to keep in mind that was RSL like, a dozen years ago yeah it's like <laughs> the best thing you know like Toronto FC did their thing get it you know Montreal knocked off Pachuca etc but if you can avoid Liga MX you would rather do that that would be ideal uh, I think our, didn't RSL do it in the group stage <sighs> they, oh boy, that's remember. a different CCL. I know era. in the knockouts, they, did. the knockouts they, didn't, they didn't play anybody. No, yeah. they didn't. From it was, it was Saprisa away. Saprisa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll, yeah. go, I'll Google. You go do your All right, cool. Key signings, Tiago Martins, DP spot for the uh, center back. That was an area that they did need to have depth and quality, so they've reinforced there. Signed some homegrowns, but it hasn't really been about that uh, for them this year. It's been about keeping Tati and then, of course, the progression of the other players in the squad. Who is the star if, let's say... We've talked about Tati. Everybody knows about Tati. I don't think we need to go back into Tati and why he's the star of this team, Doyle. So if it's not Tati who's the star, it's Maxi. who would be the star? It's Maxi. Maxi has been one of the best number 10s in MLS for half a decade now. Um, and he he is an elite chance creator. Uh, but what he's really, really good at um one of the best this league has ever seen at is rearranging the pieces on the chessboard in the way that he wants them to so that NYCFC can get into their final third kill patterns he did it under Patrick Vieira he did it under Dome Torrent and now he's done it for a couple of years under Ronnie Dyla he is like one of the best pass before the pass guys this league has ever seen. And one of the reasons why uh, NYCFC, we rave about NYCFC's fullbacks and have for five years is because Maxi is so good at finding those pockets of space and then instantly, instantly releasing the fullback, specifically the right back over the years um, into those positions that, that the man city zones, the optimal assist zones for those pullbacks to the you know to the penalty spot for those one time finishes from either the center forward or, or you know a winger cutting in or sometimes with Maxi on the trailing run, he he is just a wonderful little player to watch. They're gonna have to do a better job of managing his minutes last uh, th- this year than they did last year, but I, I think that's what Santi Rodriguez is there for. I, I think 100%. you could you could absolutely rotate him in and keep Maxi fresh for the big games and just hope that he's got 2,500 more minutes across all competitions in his legs. If Ronnie Dyla plays it like that and if Maxi buys into to being rested like that, um, then he is the star for one more year. Though I will say the hope is that Santi Rodriguez or Tyus Mano or Tiago Andrade steps up and by June we're like, oh man, it turns out this guy's the actual star or ever comes back and is fully healthy and is playing like he did in 2019. And then we're like, oh, 
wow, Ember's really, really good again. Because when that half season, when Ember came in, he had like 15 goals in 17 games. He was awesome. Uh, you're right that he, Maxi's a star. The strength of the team is they have the best center back pairing in the league. And you add the triangle with Sean Johnson. They are elite. And so to bring in a DP 26-year-old center back to either fill if Chanot's not the same guy anymore. But, and listen, he was the best player in MLS Cup, but he's older. Or to be able to slide back into a back three if you want to. Or to be able to spell those two guys or fill in for Collins if he's in you know, with Peru and, and has international duty. I think it's really good succession planning from NYCFC to have made this move. And obviously the familiarity they have with him coming from a city football group club is a luxury other teams don't have and, and they've used it well. But that shows you that they understand that base. Talos Magno, Santi Rodriguez, if it's up and down, they'll be competitive in every single game because they have that elite back line. 22 under 22, the players to watch here. Tevon Gray is uh, in that one. So, you know, look, that's the homegrown coming through, the New York City kid. Also, Tyus Magno is a 22-22 guy. He's only 19 years old. They paid a whole lot of money for him. Who would you choose as your 22-under-22? Maybe we can do both. What do you expect of Tyus Magno? Like, positionally, is he a winger? Is he a number nine? Does that depend on whether Tati's there? Probably. And then what's reasonable to expect of Tavon Gray? Anton Tinnerholm is back in training, but you figure it's going to be a while before he's realistically going to be an option here. Mm. Gray improved a ton as a right back. I've seen him as a center back the whole time he was a young player, and that's where I thought his ceiling is. And, and I still kind of feel that way, obviously. As I just said, they brought in a DP center back. So NYCFC not really opening up a, a lane for him there, but he improved as a right back. He got more comfortable getting into the attack. He got more natural in his service. The decision-making got quicker. And I would expect to see all of that continue this year. And whether he does move back to center back, he's becoming a better soccer player playing at right back for this team. And so I think I'm excited as a U.S. fan. I'm excited as a person who likes watching young players develop through the academy. Um, and so I think Tavon Gray, this could be a really good year for him. And NYCFC has shown with Joe Scally, you don't need to stay around long. If there are options coming in, if Tavon Gray starts 10, 15 games early in this season – in CCL at right back and shows that he can play there and center back. I think there's going to be teams coming and calling for him and NYCFC would be smart to potentially allow him to move on with, with Magno. We didn't see a ton of him. It looks like winger is more natural for him. He did fill in as center forward, but he doesn't seem to occupy center backs. He doesn't seem to be super comfortable with his back to goal. And it feels like you're going to get the most from him at that winger position, as well as with the depth chart. Like with Eber back, you've got three center forwards on the depth chart. And with Paraguayan winger, former DP in Russia now. Jesus Medina. Jesus, Jesus Medina gone. You have an opening now at winger. It's a, I could have given you his yeah, blood you, type. I was going to say, Medina. you have every bullet point in his entire past. You're like, what mother's name is, maiden name of. I kept of. Alan Velasco in my yeah. head. <laughs> let me just uh, uh, let me jump in on Tavon Gray real quick. Uh, he's definitely going to play right back. They, they did not go out and sign a new right back th this offseason. He started the duration of that um, – playoff run and i remember the first game against atlanta the story of that game from open play was tavon gray repeatedly repeatedly making the right run doing the things that anton tinnerholm has done over the past four years to get open and to get into those good spots for pullbacks and then never finding the the final ball and it was frustrating to watch and it was like mm, yeah this is a kid who's played most of his career or most of his youth career as a center back he's just, he's just not unnatural within three minutes within the opening three minutes in the next game against the revs Tavon Gray gets forward gets into the optimal assist zone hits a pullback right to the spot that Santi Rodriguez buries one nil NYCFC so there was Game over game improvement from him into MLS Cup. He wasn't great in MLS Cup, but he certainly wasn't bad. And oh, by the way, he is the second youngest player ever to start in MLS Cup. So I like no question to me. He is the the twenty two under twenty two player to watch. I don't think his ceiling is incredibly high, um, but when you're accomplishing that sort of th stuff during a playoff run uh, as a nineteen year old, uh, and you have the starting job entering the season, like that's the one to keep an eye on. Uh, the mailbag basically is like, can anybody help Tati score important goals? If Tati goes, who steps up? If you know, that's that's the whole mailbag here. Uh, like. 
you want to hold on until the summer. Ebert is your sort of insurance piece on the other side, and he seems to be back now, or you would assume he is, uh, from the knee injury that kept him out last year for most of the season. Do they need to go sign somebody else in the summer? Does it matter? Does Magno go up there? Like, how much of their season is truly based on Tati? Because we've kind of said, hey, they're going to have him through the summer, but that isn't a guarantee. I think the Argentinian window closes in about five days, Mm -hmm. and Brazil's window stays open until April. So there is still a scenario which Palmeiras comes in and says, you know what? I know we've been getting, we've been throwing 12 million at you. We're desperate now. We really want him, you know, Copa Libertadores, etc. Like here's the 15 slash 20 mil. Or do you just hold him and wait for Europe, Doyle? The, the, you hold him, you wait for Europe, and you hope that the answer, the goal scoring answer comes in the form of Santi Rodriguez, Tyus Magno, or uh, Tiago Andrade. That's it. That's the whole answer. Okay. That's good. Over under starts for Eber, 17 and a half. I guess that's basically will they sell Tati in the summer? Is this all competitions or is this uh, just MLS regular season? Let's just let's just say just MLS, just for funsies. I'll I'll hit the over. I'll hit the over. Oh, okay. How about CCL quarterfinals, Dave? Over or under? Quarters would mean they win the first round. That's yeah. it, yeah. So let's say CCL semifinals. I was going to say, that doesn't feel like that big of a take. You would have taken the over, uh, all right? Yeah, 100%. Um, I'll go over. You think that I think they're making the final? No, he said semifinal. Okay, so over the semifinal is... Well, anyway. I don't understand how this works <laughs> with the round. How far do you think they'll get? How far do you think they'll get? I'll, I'll say semifinal. I okay. think they face the Seattle Sounders in the semifinals. With the opportunity to play the New England Revolution. Oh, wow. Ah, let's go. He brought it full circle. He brought it full circle. Uh, we talked. We haven't done This Is Fine for them. This is a playoff team, and comfortably so, in my opinion. I think even without Tati, uh, just the level of talent and sort of the understanding and cohesion within the group, like the, the underlying numbers love them. The results love them. They actually underperformed their underlying numbers last year and still uh, had a great playoff position with the MLS Cup. Uh, why this could be this their year? Well, I think we're sort of seeing over the last five years why every year could be their year. When you have the resources they have, the scouting network that they have, the hires that they've made on the coaching side, the signings they've made on the player side, Like, there's a reason why they have the most points in MLS regular season over that time and have now added a star to it as well. So big season for NYCFC. All right, CF Montreal, Haiku, 2021. Bonjour, Club de Foot. Change is in our DNA. Patience required. Well, we wanted Montreal to be very patient. We were among those that said that they might finish last in the Eastern Conference. And boy, oh boy, did they not like that. So 2022, fueled by doubters, but still decision day duds. Can they jump the line? It proved a lot. Almost got there. Yeah, you're uh, okay. You like it? Did I'm you processing? I mean, okay, I can tell. You're like, you know, true speak, art needs to be tasted. Swish it around in your mouth, man. Spit yeah. it out. Take another right. drink. Make sure that you're picking up all the tannins. Okay, yeah, like yeah, all yeah. the different flavors that are available to you there. Uh, what is this year about in your mind of Montreal, Dave? Now that you've processed that that art, uh, I, I think you said it right. Can they take that next step? Can they jump the line of, you know, we're doing these previews, and I think there's a. a a decent pack of teams that were saying they are going to be three points in the playoffs or just three points out. And that's what Montreal was part of last year. And I don't see any reason why they couldn't be above that group. When you look at the amount of returning players, um, the spine that they have, bringing in Alistair Johnston, it feels like the cohesion and vision with Wilfred Nance, Mason Toy coming back and hopefully being healthy for the full year. Romel Kyoto missed a ton of time last year as well. I think there's every reason to believe that that's possible with this group and that you're looking at a team that will be fighting for a home playoff game and not just fighting to get in the playoffs. And you talk about change in the win last year. The change has been that they've committed themselves to bringing talent in from around MLS and using big numbers and allocation or whatever tools they have to bring in players who are already in this league that they think can be better with them and potentially be sold on rather than going outside and signing South American under 22s or big name DPs from Europe and whatnot. And I like for every MLS team to pick a vision and be committed because in a salary cap league, teams are fairly close together no matter what you do and teams that have a clear identity have been more successful and so the Alistair Johnston move obviously goes straight into that and you're talking about a guy who's flexible who has started for the Canadian national team speaks a little French because he lived in uh, Quebec for a little bit 
<laughs> and so I, I really like that move for them. Do you, should I go fear or we'll do that later? Uh, I'll let you just hold on to the fear. Like for yeah. a while here, we don't want to be doubters too early, let's right? Like, let's not bring. Let's Boom. leave the doubt for later yeah, I'll do on a here. Toy Maraca dance. Yeah, cool. key signings here: Gabriel Corbo, Alistair Johnson. You said it. They had permanent transfers of Ahmed Hamdi and Lassi Lapalainen. Uh, how about star spotlight? It's got to be Georgie uh, Doyle. So last year, a huge breakout year. 16 assists for him, 4 goals in 34 games. He was top 10 in the league in key passes. I mean, his career highs across the board. And he was one That's of the like guys that was five. like... That sounds like a top 5 number 10. Uh, it might be. We'll have to see. You know, we might, you know, might, might, might go right back into the ranks of doubters on that one. TBD. That was a huge year for Georgie. So now what? More of the same? More of the same would be nice, um, and he's he's shown over the past because his, his chance creation numbers with the fire right before they sold low on him were uh, were really really good as well. And now, yeah, you could certainly argue elite. And, and if he's just that, he's a really really good player in this league. If he's going to take the next step, it's to do. He, he has to start doing the stuff that I was talking about Maxi doing. Arranging the pieces on the chessboard, you know, finding those pockets of space a little bit deeper to get on the ball and facilitate not just build outs, but overlaps and, uh, you know, runs in behind from the, the center forwards. Because, like, I, I, I like Georgi Mihailovic a lot. He has never been as comfortable playing in the interior and being that type of number 10 as he's been finding, you know, a channel out wide or a pocket of space uh, in between the, the center back and the fullback and like just hitting the final ball. Uh, so it can he be a little bit more well-rounded? Can he be can he do the sort of stuff that Maxi does in New York or that Nico Ladero has been doing for the past seven years and in, in Seattle or that uh, Pipa Higuain was so good at over the course of his career? That is the next step for Maxi and or for for Georgie rather. And if he could he he can become that guy, I think that raises Montreal ceiling in two ways. One is obviously just attacking like if you could funnel your attack through that then you're going to have more guys getting on the ball in good spots and more creative outlets and allow guys like lap a line in a broke yard to you know get to the the end line and hit those pullbacks that are so great for forwards like mason toy or or home el kyoto um that's one two is like it helps you in rest defense It, it helps you just like Montreal could not defend by possessing the ball last year. And if their number 10 is suddenly flooding the midfield and orchestrating long sequences of play, then they are going to be able to rest by getting on the ball and tire the other team out and and run them into the ground. I think Georgie has the ability to do that. He hasn't been able to show it much with either Chicago or, or Montreal, but like that is clearly the next step for him as a soccer player 22 under 22 we have some question marks here where would we go we could go um hell of it you could go thorkelson there's not like a guy in the starting 11 right now that i look at and say yep that guy's gonna play a ton of minutes on and the 22 under 22 Sh- side shonari Ma- matthew shonari is not uh, i don't know is he i didn't i don't know his I age off Sean, the top of my head Sean 23 Yer. Isn't Sean, Sean Yeah, yeah oh, Boy, psh, get some French really, names in front of the really ETR totally crew. Gonna He's come, 23. Gonna come to, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it is one of the things with the compliments I did just give them. Um, they have not really tapped their own academy. Like, they've gone and gotten pl- young players from Signed other teams. A lot. They've, yeah. It's me too. <laughs> uh, but they have not tapped them to be MLS <laughs> players. They signed Maxime Crepeau. Right? They would sign a top three goalkeeper as a homegrown. They never gave him an opportunity. And now he will start for two teams in MLS at a high level. This is kind of one of the problems with what they've done. They don't trust something about their own pipeline. And they've been very in and out with the second team situation. They were early to have a USL team. Then they dropped it completely. Now they're not a part of MLS Next Pro right off the bat. And I think that's part of the issue is there isn't really a proper you know, gateway from the academy to the first team. And that's what you see with this group. 
um, and it's what we've seen with them for a while. But they do give young players from other places opportunity. Uh, I've heard Thorkelson's probably not ready this year, uh, so it probably won't be him. All right, over under, 10.5 Mason Toy goals. Uh, I'll hit the over. Over. He had seven yeah, in over. 900 minutes last year. He was the he, he was a leading domestic goal scorer before he got hurt, and he was like third in the league in goals. And, and so I like yeah, I, I'm a big believer in Mason Toy this year. I think he's going to end up closer to 15. Over under Mason Toy and Romo Kyoto goals 24 and a half. Under. Under. So you're betting against Kyoto in that scenario it feels like. I think like. so, yeah. I think so. I, th- I think he'll be good, but I think that we're, we're kind of hitting the, the end of the Romel Kyoto elite player experience. That has been... I've said it for four I straight years. that's been a false dawn The theme before. of Romel <laughs> Kyoto's last four years of like, ah, this has got to be it for Romel, and then he just, he keeps... he's If he's healthy, he right, is but like, almost impossible to deal with what's the on most the break. Goals, almost impossible. What's the most goals that Romel Kyoto has scored in a season the, the, past, the past few years? I want to say he had... 12, 14? Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to guess 12 with the Dynamo. I'm looking it up. I'm bringing it up right now. We have got eight. So we overestimated. Eight was the most he scored. He never scored more than seven with the Dynamo. He had twelve career. His his MLS career. He had twelve assists in eighteen with the Dynamo. So that's maybe where we're getting that twelve number, Dave. Just to give us a little bit of credit here. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) All right. Uh, I mean, you'd love to see a little David Goss theorem with ET friend of the show Bjorn Johnson. You would. Uh, I'm not sure he fits though. I'm not sure he fits. Ibrahim. No, I, I don't know that either of them do. And, and that's the other question with Co- Kyoto and Toy is, is it the same setup as last year? And Kyoto is a second forward. How does Joaquin Torres get into the lineup? Um, and he's got an ability to just create magic, but he's inconsistent. But this is what this team's trying to develop and trying to develop guys like that. So there are a few different pieces that Nance can use in the attack and sort of move around in a few different ways. Vincent says, is it even possible for Montreal to have a truly dominant team with such a young player, heavy squad? Are they bound to be an edge of the playoffs team yet again? That's going to sum up our this is fine and why it could be their year predictions. Uh, my thoughts on Montreal is pretty good defensively last year, and you add Alistair Johnson in there. Yeah, they got a good they got a good like solid foundation there with Pied also and also Wanyama protecting. Rudy Camacho. I know Rudy Camacho was good last year. He they resigned him. He's ever played. Yeah, not to be a starter, I hope. Well, TBD on that one. There's the buzzer. Let me, uh, let make me ask you. just heard Rudy My, Camacho's name <laughs> and hit the buzzer. Let me, ask you, let me ask you guys real quick. If you're a Montreal fan, given how, uh, how much of a trial long CCL runs have been for MLS teams traditionally, like obviously there are outliers, are you kind of rooting for your team to go out early in this one and just get no. into the regular season? No. No, I think it's. A, I think it'd be important for them to get it. Like if they if they take down Santos Laguna in round of sixteen for a younger team that again had the doubters, bucked against the doubters, but still didn't make the playoffs last year. I think that would be sort of a big moment for them as a group. And then look, if Cruz Azul knocks you out in the quarters, no shame. Yeah, and no shame if Santos does it as well. I think for this team, they got to find a way. And you sort of said it about Georgie Doyle to create more opportunities from those prime assist zones as opposed to just being a like, hey, Toy and Romel on the break team. You know, defensively, I think they're going to be fine. I have questions about whether they can consistently create goal-scoring chances uh, from from like the run of play or from possession. We shall see. Uh, now it's time to uh, talk to Wilfred Nance, the manager of CF Montreal. It's part of our MLS Works Black History Month speaker series. Wilfred, welcome to Extra Time. Thank you, thank you. So let's start with CONCACAF Champions League. All the other MLS teams, they get non-Liga MX teams. But Montreal gets Santos Laguna. You guys have a big test from the very, very start. How are you approaching this series? I would say, you know, this is our story. This is, uh, it's been always like that uh, for face adversity. So, listen, this is going to be a good game for us. Uh, Santos Laguna, we know that this is a really good team. Yes, for the moment, they struggle a bit. But uh, they only played four games. But... Um, no, we are excited to play this kind of game. It's going to be good for my young team and for my team to face a, a good opponent and uh, in a challenge environment and uh, exciting. So I threw out the name uh, Eddie Sobrango in our preview for Montreal. I don't know if, if Eddie's uh, if you're familiar with Eddie and his legendary tie against Santos Laguna, 
But this club has so much history in this competition, whether it be back in those USL days, and I followed along with you guys and was actually at both legs of the Club America final as well. What does CCL mean to Montreal? To me, it feels like this fan base, this club, understands something about it, appreciates something about it that not all MLS clubs do. Yeah, good memories. Because uh, I remember when when we faced uh, La Santos Laguna, we faced uh, Club America also, and uh, we had a lot of fans. So the the the, the population and the fans, they, they understand what it, what does it means because they lived it. They lived it, and uh, the fact that we faced this kind of team, they saw different football, they saw a different atmosphere. And I remember when we played against uh, Club America, we had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, around uh, 45,000. Uh, it, it's one of the best games I've ever been at in person. It was yeah. electric. So honestly, it was exciting, and uh, and this is what we we want to do, and uh, this is good memory. So I, I called uh, Eddie Sebongo to know if he was uh, able to play for us uh, tonight, enfin tomorrow. But <laughs> <laughs> this is not possible. But no, good memories, and like you said, we have uh, an history behind that. That's why uh, Mon- Montreal knows. What does it mean for us? And this is a really good competition and uh, we want to do well. Tell me what to expect from your team this year. And, and I know managers sometimes push back against formation talk, but it might be helpful for those of us to sort of understand what you're trying to do. We saw a lot of that, the three center backs last year with the wing backs pushed up. Will we see sort of that three, four, I don't know, three-ish? Or will we see more of a four-man back line from you? What do you, what do you prefer? Last year, we it was a three each <laughs> because you know we um yes we we played uh, it was not planned to play with a uh, back five or back three uh, we started with a back four and um, and after that we decided after the the the, the second uh, friendly game that we're gonna change and after that my plan was also to come back with the back four because I like to get also. Uh, uh, tactical flexibility with my team, but I felt and uh, I felt that uh, it was the good uh, shape, good system, I would say, for my players. But um, it's a back three each because we, um, depending the opposition, we had uh, a couple of uh, tactical tactical flexibility. Uh, sometimes it was uh, yes, the wing back high. Sometimes it was the wing back inside. Sometimes it was uh, try to overload the middle, try to overload uh, out wide. And this year is going to be the same because we know that uh, uh, we can play in this system, but we can also manipulate. Also, uh, I would say start with a back three and uh, and uh, plus two midfielder, plus back two and three midfielders. It depends. It's all about. I try to uh, not. I try. We worked. Uh, with my players to have a couple of animation that they can uh, embrace and leave it. And, uh, and after that, tactically, I would find a good way uh, uh, depending the opposition. Feels like Alistair Johnson's a pretty ideal sort of acquisition for you guys in that sense and that he can sort of transition between there's a lot of tactile flexibility with the way he can play both sort of that outside center back role or right back if you do want to transition to it. What, what was what was behind that signing? How big of a role will he, will he play this year? First of all, this is uh, he likes to defend. First of all, he likes to defend and for us uh, and for me and for the staff and the, the club, this is really important because yes, I want to attack uh, but at the same time, to uh, we need to get a player to... They have to be. Uh, they have to handle the one v one situation, and because for me, uh, I believe on that, uh, especially when we attack in terms of uh, rest defense or preventive coverage. For me, this is the way I, I see that. Uh, my players have to be brave with the one v one, and uh, Alistair could be uh, one of the players for that. He's like that, and also like you said, offensively, uh, in terms of uh, tactical flexibility, he can play. Uh, he can play in the middle. He can play. Uh, on the wing, he can play in between the middle and the wing. So again, I'm going to play with that. And uh, he, he loves that. So this is perfect. Who is the most important player, in your opinion, to the way that you want to play? What does a lot of this hinge on? You know, I think a lot of people would look at Georgie and his numbers that he put up last year, but maybe you would have a different interpretation. It's difficult to, to answer because, yes, it could be Georgie. But again, me for me last year, the... The player who, who set the tempo, it was Rudy Camacho. Because the way we play, we try to play from the back, 
So we tried to manipulate the opposition, and uh, and uh, and Rudy is able to to understand that and uh, the the nuance between play short or play long or to attract the opposition or play quick, and uh, so so it was uh, it was really good last year for that, and that's why also we had uh, we had uh, it was uh, easier for me to to move a bit the shape depending uh, the opposition. We had ten and a half goals as an over under for Mason Toy, and I think everybody on the show in the preview for you guys said that Mason would score more than ten and a half goals. What do you think about that? Is that prediction going to be right? Honestly, uh, for me, Mason is a. Uh, I don't know if I can say in English, but he's uh, limitless. Uh, hmm. he can he has a. Um, Yes, quality. We know that. Uh, at the same time, we have to tune him in terms of uh, uh, concept. But uh, he has this ability to be uh, composed in front of the net. Uh, he can score with the head. He can score with his feet. He can score. So again, it's a complete uh, forward. He needs to learn now how to play with his body, how to recognize the concept, to get in behind, to come to the ball. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it's a good young player, so I'm happy. I'm happy uh, with uh, Mason. I'm taking the over on that one. I think more than ten and a half goals. Let's see it from Mason Toy. Can I ask you what the next step is for this team? Last year, every you know, they were, you guys were really on the. You're like, hey, these doubters out there, probably me included, no, no more. and you proved them wrong. But then decision day was a disappointment. What is the next step? How do you both in results, but also in the way that you get results? No, uh, you know, for me, the the, the next step is to uh, is to do the same and to be more efficient. Because the way we play, we have a, a way to play. So I want to, I want my team to keep going with that because for me, this is the only way we can adjust, but also to be more efficient. Because last year, it's normal that in the beginning of the year, we had a bad uh, pronostic, I would say, but uh, normal. Nobody uh, knows the team, nobody knows me, and uh, me, I'm okay with that. And, uh, and the field uh, thought. And uh, that's why this year is going to be uh, going to try to do to do the same. But we need to be more efficient because last year we didn't make the playoff because we we conceded a soft goal and we missed uh, a lot of tapping, but a lot. And again, it's normal because we have a young team, and uh, as you know, as a human being, you have to you have to you have to leave that to to progress to improve. But it was tough was tough because uh, the way we conceded. Uh, some goals, it was uh, it was difficult. That's why we did not make the playoff. But in the way we played, in the way we tried to uh, to uh, approach each game, it was the same. And uh, I'm really proud uh, about this. So it's going to be the same this year. And hopefully we're going to be able to uh, to do better. What What's an area that you sort of reflected on for yourself in the offseason, whether it be as a coach, as a person, what did you learn in, in your first full season here as manager? I learned that uh, as a manager and also as a, as a person that we have to be uh, comfortable in a difficult uh, situation who are uncomfortable. And uh, I don't know if you understand my English, but... Uh, oh yeah, I got you. For me, this is, uh, this is a key point because uh, sometimes you have to take decisions and this is not for the player, this is not for the club, this is about to put the best team uh, to succeed. And also, also me as a player, sometimes as a coach, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to take also decision. I think about uh, the team first, the player first, not me. So and sometimes this is not what I like, but I have to do it. So uh, I realize that as a coach, um, I like to be close, find a good balance to be close with my player, but also to be uh, demanding about what we want to do on the pitch. And to find this balance, this is not easy because, as you know, there is a lot of personality as a human being. So I have to. But again, this is. Um, I was happy last year because uh, with the staff, we, we created a, an environment that the players are feel safe and we can. We can. They were brave also, so we can go into details without to be, uh, being. Uh, upset about something so this is the purpose of the 
good reminder for people that sometimes the soccer is easy. The personal sides are, uh, that's not the easiest part of being a manager in any way. Uh, Wilfred Nance, we really appreciate your time. Good luck against Santos Laguna. You know we're rooting for the, uh, I almost said it, for, for Montreal. Those are the old days for Montreal in the CONCACAF Champions League. Thank you, Coach. We appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Truly excited uh, for the season in Montreal. ton of talent there. We will see if they can capitalize on it. Now it's time for the Colorado Rapids, who definitely did that in 2021. Here was their haiku. The young and restless. They're the butt of jokes no more. Promise must pay off. And in so many ways, it did. They were first in the Western Conference. Now it didn't happen in the playoffs, and maybe that's what this year is about. We'll discuss in just one second. So here's their haiku for 2022. Fever dream? No. First. New number to watch is nine. Would you bet on them? Both in the nine as well as to repeat what they did last year. I, if I have to explain it, I don't know if that's the, my best haiku, but I did like the middle <laughs> line about the new number to watch is nine. They say they're looking for efforting to get a number nine. There are also reports that the budget is is not mind-blowing in that sense, so we'll see if they get that done over time. And, and look, Pork Smith as well as Robin Frazier have said repeatedly that, that they like their options there and Shinashiki and Rubio, et cetera. Uh, and you know, even even Michael Barrios has played there before. So Doyle, this year for the Rapids, did first in the West come a little bit early? Did it change expectations in the wrong way? What should we expect from Colorado in 2022? Uh, I think more of the same. I think ending somewhere between like 1.6 and 1.8 or 1.9 points per game uh, seems about right, unless they go out and get that number nine. The, the structure of this team is obviously so sound. Even having sold Sam Vines, they immediately replaced him with a very good left back. I have no doubt that they'll be able to account for the losses, the, the sales and loan of, of, of uh, Kellen Acosta and Cole Bassett. Like, Robin Frazier has, has shown he knows how to build a really solid team. Um, and they took that to the playoffs, and they outplayed – uh, Portland for 70 minutes and they created a number of good chances and they did not have a playoff caliber goal scorer to put the ball in the back of the net. If you take that team last year, and I don't think 1.8 points per game was a, was a, you know, a mirage. They were 1.7 points per game in like combined 20 and 21 under Robin Frazier. So it's not like they made this incredible leap. It was just steady growth. If you take that team last year and add a 20 goal scorer, then, like, the ceiling for this team is Supporter Shield. The ceiling for this team is MLS Cup. Um, if you don't do that, the ceiling for this team is, is is what we saw last year. And I don't think that they will hit that ceiling because the West is better than it was last year. Key signings or losses, depending. You know, they trade Kellen Acosta. That is a loss for them. But they go in the reentry draft to get Brian Acosta. Max Olives is an attacking midfielder that comes in and replaces sort of Cole Bassett's production, they would hope. Abubakar Keda is a defender ever from the crew, young guy that we've all had good words about uh, in the past, but has some some rough edges to, uh, to sand off. He comes in because Austin Trusty will go to Arsenal in the summer. Other than that, they made a bunch of re-signings, made sure their core is sticking around, whether it be Mark Anthony Kay or Jack Price or you know Keegan Rosenberry, like basically the whole team. They're like, hey, if you're an important part and you're in a good part of your, your career as far as age goes, you have a new contract, you're staying with us, we're running it back. So those are the key signings. Uh, I, can I just ask Brian Acosta, do we, what do we think they're going to get from Brian Acosta this year? Or is that sort of the whole question with Brian Acosta? It's always a question with Brian Acosta. It, it, I, it I'm is, definitely going to ask Robin. We're going to ask Robin about it when we have him on here in like 10 minutes. It is a very rapid move because why not? And he shouldn't be a starter going into the season, which is a former DP from another team isn't a starter for you. But I've always felt the biggest issue with him is I think he's too slow. And so I don't think he is soccer IQ so far off the charts to cover that. Uh, but at the same time, Jack Price plays defensive mid for this team and has for a couple of years. So... Maybe they have a, a setup and a system for it. But all of those pieces that you said, they're all could be replacements for guys that have left or would leave. But they have other options, too. And that's what they've done a really good job with um, as a club. And, and I think there's also a group of academy players they feel can play at an MLS level that they signed a whole group, what, two years ago? Yeah. And none of them were even with the first team. Everyone was the Colorado Switchbacks, had success there. 
other teams as well. I still think they're probably a year or two away, but that's part of this planning in terms of the Rapids, you know, what this group will look like over the next three, four years. Let me just say, uh, Brian Acosta, talent, super talented player, not an effective player. I don't know if it's about, I, I don't necessarily agree that it's about speed. It's about, you know, decision making for him. Like he, he has that gene where he wants to, you know, he wants to hit the home run every single time. I, if Robin Frazier can, he's a modern day major league baseball player, yeah, right? <laughs> if, if Robin Frazier can, can reach him, then this becomes a, a brilliant signing in the way that Anibal Godoy has turned into a brilliant signing for Nashville SC because any Quakes fan will tell you they were happy to see Anibal Godoy go. Because he, like, there were so many times in the buildup, like, the, the pattern play was starting and he would just decide it's time to spray a ball that had zero chance of, of getting through. And with, with Brian Acosta, it's kind of the same thing. And, you know, Gary Smith obviously figured something out how to unlock um, the best out of Godoy. And if. <laughs> If Frazier can do that with Brian Acosta, that midfield of Price, Acosta, and Mark Anthony K is going to win you some games. Ah, in very ETR fashion, we managed to get uh, like two and a half, three minutes mm-hmm. conversation out of ten on Brian Acosta. That's why we're here. Star Spotlight. We have Jack Price down here. Twelve assists in thirty games last year. He was among our, you know, he's a third team best eleven. I was going to throw out Robin Frazier as the star. No, it's Mark. Okay, fine. It's, it's Mark. Mark Anthony K. And Mark Anthony K, the reason that, as a soccer fan, you should be excited to see him with the Rapids is it's an opportunity for him to carry teams and be a game winner. And no, he's not going to put up 17 assists and 15 goals, uh, but he breaks lines. He's creative with his passing. He wants to come and take the ball off the back line and di- dictate passing. It worked last year. Part of Kellen Acosta leaving is I think Mark Anthony K was always going to slide deeper and permanently be deeper in that midfield and be the guy who touches the ball constantly and is all over the field. So I, to me, that's the answer to that question. Obviously, they need goal scoring. And so if someone does that, they'll become the star player. Anyone who gets into double digits uh, or is a consistent finisher. But Mark Anthony K has the highest ceiling on this team. And if he can play a certain way, I think it changes this team's ability to win these tough games in knockout situations. I love Mark Anthony K on the half turn. Like if there's those little moments you get to watch an MLS game or players, you're like, okay, I want to watch him in this scenario. I want to watch Mark Anthony K in that little pocket of space where he gets you on his hip on the wrong side, receives the ball to his feet, and then all of a sudden you're three steps behind him and he's pushing up field. It's wonderful to watch. 2222 player to watch. You mentioned some of those homegrowns. There are guys that are maybe going to break in this year and start to see minutes. And like Yappy, Toure, some of the others, they really like those guys, but they might be just a little bit too far down the chip chart. Lucas Estevez was brought in to replace Sam Vines. Uh, 15 games in 2021. He seems to be the starting left back. Uh, I, I don't know that this it, team he's is the theorem. You think he's, he's that a, is impressive. He's a theorem was, guy. No, not, they didn't need it oh. right off the bat. He was good, which is why Max Alves, you got to have a little excitement. The Rapids might be an anti theorem team. Oh, I, can you? T- but then that doesn't that hurt your theorem? If you no, the, the, it's, no, there's it's, always oh, going to be the exception. The, that the best the rules rule. have an exception. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, okay. I got you, David. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> I'm here for that, I guess. I'll see you at Gillette for the CCL fight. <laughs> sweet, sweet. Uh, all right. A mailbag question was: with the Rapids need to do, do the Rapids need to start spending money at some point this season, or will they be to run it back with the same model and achieve similar results? I think we've sort of already answered that one. Yeah. I do want to ask basically a bigger question about goal scoring and, and where it comes from if they don't go get this. This nine. I mean, sort of down the stretch last year, Dom Baji was like a guy that they leaned on. Nobody scored more than 10 goals in this team. If you're going through last year, just in MLS, Barrios with eight, Jonathan Lewis with seven. From there, you got a couple guys with five. Cole Bassett had five. Diego Rubio had five. Dominic Baji had five in 328 minutes. Shinashiki had four. And then it's a bunch of twos from like Danny Wilson and Keegan Rosenberry and Galvan, who's I, 
out for the season, which was a huge, huge bummer. And then a bunch of ones from sort of like defenders and random pop ups. I think they had how 18, concerning is that? Really, they had eighteen different players score. I think the number was last year, which <laughs> is like a lot. Yeah, really, their top score is set pieces. Like, yeah, that's that's their top score, and that's why that's why the, the that's what the argument is for Price as the star of this team because his set piece delivery is the best in MLS. All due respect to, to Carlos Heel, um, it, it's it's Jack Price who has been you know definitive with that uh look jonathan lewis seven goals in 1300 minutes this is the first time i think he's ever gone into a season as a presumed starter if he doubles his minutes and double his doubles his goals output then like that's a really really good year it's massive but isn't that that's the i was gonna say that's like so the constant if so but i was gonna say the same thing because remember with lewis it wasn't injuries he was with the olympic team to start the year and miss time, and then he was with the Gold Cup team, either going into it or at the Gold Cup. I don't remember all that. He would have scored double-digit goals last year if th- that was not the case, and it probably won't be the case this year for him. So it's n- I get the if it around him is can he be a consistent guy you trust? Mm. I'm not saying that. If you give me your over-under is nine and a half goals on Jonathan Lewis for the season, I didn't look at the rundown, so I don't know if it is, then I would go over. That's not the over under. Uh, TBD on Lewis. Can I just uh, DP DP's signed this year? You can include summer in that. At, at, uh, I was gonna say maybe half, 0. 0.5, but I'll say one and a half. DP's signed. Under. Under. You just, I'll go under. under. I think they signed under. More. I would go under too. How about sixty and a half points? Basically, will they be another? Will they be an elite team again? Under. I'll go under. Um, I think they'll have a home playoff game, and if you're around fifty five. Over the last few years, you can do that. But I think with CCL, and I think they'll focus on it, they'll go under. All right. Well, we all agree they're a playoff team. It's just a matter of where they end up and what they do in the transfer market. Uh, let's talk to Robin Frazier. Again, part of our MLS Works Black History Month Speaker Series and AT&T 5G call to the field. Always a pleasure to have Robin Frazier on Extra Time. Robin, welcome from Orlando, where you guys are doing your preseason thing and preparing to head uh, to CCL here in just a little bit. How you doing? Great, great, great. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Uh, always a pleasure. It must be that time of year again. Season's <laughs> getting started. Yeah, well, you know, we get you at different times. You know, back in the day, it was always good to... I remember we did a, a MLS story time with you that still sticks out to me as one of the best we've ever done. And unfortunately, we don't have an hour and a half to tell... Uh, Stories from, you know, the Foxes and everything before that. So we got we to gotta jam this in here. And let's start with your expectations for this season uh, and with CCL. We had uh, John Arnold on the show, and I'm hopeful, man. I, I always want MLS to win it, and I always believe that we can. How do the Rapids make a run? Like, what, what's the scenario here? Do you guys believe? Well, I mean, for us, it's it sounds like a broken record because every time we talk about a team, it's similar stuff. But it's about the collective. And for us, it's a... Uh, the unselfishness, the willing to work for each other, willingness to work for each other. Uh, these are things that make the difference for our team. And we feel like uh, we go into this Champions League with a good idea and a decent game plan. And, um, you know, we certainly this first leg in Guatemala is an important start. We want to have a good showing and uh, certainly come out of that with a good result and be building going into the next round, into the next leg and into the beginning of the season. So uh, preseason has been geared a lot on us getting our principles and fundamentals down and uh, the various ways to apply those principles against various types of competitions. Comunicaciones first and maybe New York City FC or Santos TBD and then on and running from there with MLS in the meantime. You said it's about the collective. We know that. We, I think we put an over-under on points for you guys at 60 and a half. What's the next step for the Rapids this year? What would you say? Over-under 60 and a half. You know what I would say the next step is, is um, advancing, continuing to advance. So Two years ago, we wanted to get to the playoffs. We got to the playoffs and didn't play particularly well in that first game. We lost to Minnesota. So our goal was to obviously get beyond the first round. And last year, we uh, did well, ended up winning the West, but fell short in the first game. But we thought we played well enough to win it, but in the end, we, we didn't. So the next goal for us has to be to go farther than we did last year. Uh, I hear Porig talking about a quest. 
a quest for a number nine and folks like me are a broken record, probably not fairly so at times, but maybe fairly so at other times, about the the lack of a big-time goal scorer. And in fact, you guys don't even have any DPs right now, and yet it doesn't seem to have really affected the results last year in the regular season. How is that quest for a number nine going? Is it truly necessary for this team? Uh, I think we're always looking for good players. Um, I think you're always looking for the best players that you can find and that fit into your system. And I think that that, that quest is an ongoing one for, for us. Um, but for me, I... I like a lot of our guys. Johnny plays as a nine. Diego has been very good uh, in preseason. Mikey plays as a nine. All three guys score goals from there. Uh, Andre Shinyashiki over the years has um, had really good moments as a nine as well. So while we are always looking to improve and always looking to, to find players that we think can help us, uh, we really like the team. And... Uh, for us to go farther, everyone talks about spending more money. And sure, we, again, you know, it's, it's finding the right players to fit into our system, not just ability, but personality and attitude. And uh, until we find those players, we push on with what we have. And I think what we have are some good players, some good and underrated players. Uh, you switch to Costas. Kellen to LAFC in a trade. And in comes Brian. We had a long discussion about Brian Acosta uh, before you came on right here and about what he could be in Colorado. And it just never felt like he reached sort of his potential with FC Dallas. One thing about your team is that guys that play for you on this rapid scene, they seem to reach their potential. How do you help Brian Acosta reach his potential? You know, we've only had him for a couple of days because he was with Honduras and he had COVID. So he's come in. Um, I think he's probably had about four days of training. Well, that's and- not much and 45 minutes in the game the other day so what he's got is he's he has a good instinct about how and when to close things down uh he's strong he's physical um and he's a good passer so our goal with him over the next short period of time is to just get him up to speed as to how we do things and what we expect out of him and his role he has all the physical attributes to excel with us And it really is just a matter of getting up to speed with what we expect from our players in those positions and what his responsibilities are. And you give him that, that framework, and then within that framework, he gets to do what he does best. And uh, a lot of that is about how well he reads the game and how well he closes things down. Like I say, he's a good passer, comfortable with the ball. Uh, Really, we, we certainly expect big things from him. Did you know Mark Anthony when you were at Toronto? Was he in the... Briefly, really? Yeah, yeah, just a little. And, you know, we've talked about this quite a bit, Greg and I have. Um, and he was, I think, a winger. Yeah. Or kind of a wide player. And he really flourished as he went on to become a center midfielder. And I thought at LAFC, he showed the ability to be one of the best final passers in the league. And so that was certainly the reason uh, that we were excited to get him when we did. What do you like about him, and what role will he play in this team? Not not just as a player, but also as a person. I think that clearly is very important in your teams. Yeah, I think as a person, he is an experienced guy who's going through a tremendous journey at the moment with the Canadian national team. Um, and what they're doing is only further enhancing the confidence of the individual Canadian player. So as he comes in here, he's a guy who's... You know, on his way to being on a World Cup team, um, he played in the game. That's one of the best games I've seen an opposing team play in Azteca when Canada played there earlier. So he's got really good experience now, uh, really good confidence because of that experience. And what that gives him is a very calm demeanor uh, when things start to go crazy. And when you're in the middle of a game, you want to have guys that you feel like are grounded and can help keep the other guys grounded. I think it was it with his experience and his personality, the way he talks to other guys on the team, he's constantly trying to help guys. Um, as a person, he's he's huge for our team. As a player, as I said, I think when he has time and space and can look forward, he's as good a final passer as there is in the league. He waits through balls very well. Uh, he sees and looks for final passes and delivers and executes them very well. 
He also embraces the crazy a little bit, right? Like he, he seems to thrive when it gets a little crazy. No? Yeah. yeah. He's like a feels like a CCL player to me. A guy that's not gonna be uh too overawed by the strangeness of our region at times. Absolutely. Between the officiating and some of the conditions that occur in some of these games, you definitely want to have a core of guys that can keep their heads in spite of what's going on. And I think Mark's, Mark helps us that way. Give me one academy kid that you think is going to make a, a – can make an impact this year. You have a group of guys that I've heard a lot about, but maybe when you look at the depth chart or sort of like in that – you know, middle ground where nothing's really expected this year, but they have the talent to ask a few questions. Well, I don't know if they still count as academy guys, but um, Darren Yappi and and Yaya Torre uh, spent most of last year with the Switchbacks, our USL affiliate in Colorado Springs, and they've definitely made strides. Yappi first came to preseason with us two years ago when he was 15, and while he physically looked like a man, he definitely played like a child. And he has grown up a lot in the last two years. He's very mature. Uh, he's really come along well. And Yaya Torre uh, is a hard, hard worker. He's technically gifted. He's got great pace. And for him, it's been a real learning experience as to not only how to fit into our system, but how to be a professional. And as young players, that's part of it. It's getting them ready for for those moments where... Either we're going to need them or, you know, if they, they do really well and they go off to other places, the idea is to have them prepared for those moments. And those are two guys who are, who are coming along and knocking on the door. And they've, they've had, both had really good moments in preseason, really excited about the direction that they're headed in. So uh, I have one last question for you, and you've done Yeoman Works at the Rapids, but I want to go to some of the other things that you've been working on personally. You were part of the committee that got a new diversity hiring initiative over the line last fall, and it, 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 it makes significant strides, I think. But I would be curious what you would say are the next steps. You know, like what we have is never, is never good enough. That's sort of the, the underlying message. How do we make next steps? How do we make sure that that hiring initiative actually does the things it says it's going to do? Uh, well, we have to follow up, certainly. Uh, there are penalties for going outside of what has been now designated. Um, and the league has to be, I think, really on top of it and uh, monitor closely in some of the hiring policies. And then I think on the other side, people just have to be open-minded and be willing to take a look at someone instead of con- constantly recycling the same coaches. Uh, just just be open-minded. No one is saying that you should hire an inferior coach. No chance. We're saying that everybody wants to win, but uh, I think a big part of it is just being able to um, open up the search and give more people opportunities. And without a doubt, you're going to get surprises. Uh, it just That's just how it is. And at the end of the day, you know, as I've said so many times, that no one is looking for a handout or to be given anything. You just want an opportunity. And if you go in there and you don't present yourself or your ideas well enough and you don't get hired, then so be it. But that's part of the learning process as well is to go through the interview process. Uh, no, figure out how to put your thoughts down in a way that they can, they're relatable. And, um, you know, so I think there is what this does is it opens doors. And as long as people are willing to be open minded, Um, And then on the other side, candidates have to prepare themselves. And so I think if those two things happen, then we'll see uh, maybe slightly uh, slight changes. And it's not, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but that's it. It's incremental steps. And I think this sets up the next step. What do you think is the next step? Just more hires, more, more people actually acting on that? Like, what did you Uh, learn from this process that you were a part of? What did I learn? Yeah. What did you take away? Maybe not learn, but what like the little things as you're a part of it, you're thinking, oh, that's that's interesting, this perspective, or boy, that's something that we really have to shift in people's minds. No, I, I think having been interviewed many, many times over the years, uh, the biggest thing that I believe I've learned is that you have to be ready. You have to prepare yourself. You have to be able to present your ideas in a coherent way. So the next steps for me are just simply that is uh, more opportunities, more people be willing to be open-minded, present more opportunities to minority candidates. And those candidates have to be ready. Uh, that's really all you're asking for is an opportunity. And what people do with the opportunities is 
is really the determining factor. But the first step is that people just have to be more open minded and be willing to look at a wider net, um, cast a wider net while looking for candidates. Well, we hope it results in uh, what it's aiming for here, but we know what you've done with the Rapids so far. It's been extremely impressive, and now we get to see it in CCL, and we get to see it another season with you guys wearing the number one tag from last year in the West. Robin, always a pleasure to talk to you, man. Good luck in Guatemala. Thank you, Andrew. Good to see you. Oh, big thanks to Robin. What a packed show this is. Anders is going to tear his hair out. He may or may not have just put into the chat, quote, in all caps, I will end all of you. Zero chance we have time for mailbag, to which I say, we shall see, Anders. ETR top fives roll on. The number tens. We had a lot of debate about this one. It was difficult. This list is deep. It is impressive. It has former MVPs that did not make our top five. It has MLS Cup MVPs that did not make our top five. It has players that haven't made a, played a minute in this league, and many people say are not even number tens in our top five. Uh, Doyle, help people understand the difficulty of decision-making that we had when it came to number 10s in this league and why it was so difficult. Very simply, there are two different types of of number 10s in this league right now. There are the classic South American-style number 10s, guys who get on the ball, dictate everything, primary chance creators, you know, a threat to get 20 assists, guys like, um, you know, Reynoso, Heal, Maxi Morales, Nico Ladero, if he's healthy, Sebastian Blanco, if he's healthy, is I think more that type of guy. And then there are, you know, more modern interpretations of number 10s, guys who are goal scorers. Demir Krylak plays as a number 10 for RSL. Hani Mukhtar plays as a number 10 uh, for... Uh, for Nashville, uh, I think Shakiri will play for a number ten as a number ten. For, like we had Ezra Hendrickson on the show saying he's going to play as a number ten for Chicago. Those guys, chance creators, but primarily goal scorers for their team. So you're really talking about two different roles within this. And I think for all of them, like obviously Demir Krylock is better as a second forward in a 3-5-2 than as a number 10 in any situation. But like second forward traditionally for a lot of teams has been the team's number 10. So it's like, it, it's more, it's hard. It's hard. It's it's hard. And like, I, there's an argument to break it into two separate types of buckets, which we don't have the time to do or Anders will destroy all of us. So if you're not getting your quota of ETR today, folks, it's because of Anders. You can blame Anders. Blame the Seattle Sounders, Wow, look at actually. this. Look at this flip-flop here. He goes from like demanding that he be he a partner in soccer, yeah. <laughs> which and now he's like and now he's just beep 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 back in the bus up on poor Anders. Everyone man. I'm knows, coming to your defense. Everyone knows Doyle's an activist, but once he gets into office, he doesn't know how to handle <laughs> oh, wow. all the different sides. Easy, easy. <laughs> then his des- then his destructive energy comes out. All right, our top top five number tens. Number five. Shakiri, everybody's going to yell at us for this one. They're going to say he's not truly a number 10. But I, you know what? If Ezra Henderson came up this show. I don't think that's why people are going to yell at you. Well, there's multiple reasons. Okay. You can do your for reason first, and then I'll, I'll do my Okay. Now. The reason is I say he's a number 10 because Ezra says he's a number 10. If that's where they're going to play him, given his prodigious talent, well, that's, that's where we should consider him, I think. But then you're probably going to say the reason people are going to get mad at me is because he hasn't played very much over the last four years, and we haven't seen an a single minute of him in MLS. I wasn't even going to say four years. You just dunked on yourself there, so Uh, I'll take it. This is just as much your list as it is my list. Uh, You were part of this process. I... If I stand firmly against one specific name ever, then I don't stand with the full list. That's wow. how I've decided over the course of well, this. David wow. Goss is a maximalist. Uh, <laughs> won't, take, won't take ownership whatsoever. And, well, Shakiri's at five. And, and I think when he came in the league, I said he should be that player. But I just got to see it for 15 minutes in MLS first before I'm ready to put him on the list. Okay, that's fine. But he is on the list. So he's, he's number five on the <laughs> cool. list. Uh, number four, Maxi Morales. Could not have this list without Maxi. The level he's had over the years, the influence he had on MLS Cup winning team. I know he's probably on the back end, you know, age. They're not going to play him, you know, 36 games or 34 games next year. Uh, but but just, you know, for pure quality, for influence on the league, we went Maxi Morales at number four. Uh, this is an interesting one because Doyle was not about this one, but we sort of overruled him. We have Hani Mukhtar at three. But, Doyle, you didn't think that this was a place – really a list for Hani because he's more of a second forward, but yeah. I think the rest of us said, look, the numbers he put up last year, the influence he had on what was one of the really good teams in the league in Nashville, uh, he deserved and to be here. the influence he has on the field. 
Yep. Right. And and for everything we say about different types of tens, the big thing is they're the best player on the field. When they touch the ball, every t- player on the defending team reacts in a different way than when someone else does. And everyone in the stands reacts in a different way. And Hani Mukhtar has all of that. And we saw it in the playoffs and we saw it in the regular season and we saw it on de- decision day in every big moment. And if he wears number 10 and he scores a lot of goals and gets a lot of assists and is a dominant player, then he's on this list. Would you like to – you're not going to share your – No, I don't. I'd rather just get to the mailbag. I hate these lists. Okay. Uh, uh, what? Emmanuel <laughs> that, Reynoso is I'm number two. I'm excited about that because you're going to hate the mailbag. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Emmanuel Reynoso is number two on this list. Uh, outside Carlos Hill, he was the best chance creator in the uh, in the league last year. He uh, – both sides of the ball, really. I mean, he's just a magic man with it at his feet. So uh, Carlos Hill is number one. And, uh, yeah, the, the guys that didn't make it here are Nico Ladero, Alejandro Pozuelo, uh, Lucho Acosta, Tiago Amada, Lucas Delarayan, Georgi Mihailovic, Demir Krylock, Sebastian Blanco, Ryan Gold, Sebastian Driussi. That is a decent crop of number 10s, and you probably have something to yell about uh, today at us. Let's go to the mailbag, 401-206-0 MLS, extra time at MLSsoccer.com. David, take it away. We got a, a text here, so I don't know who it's from. It says, kind of off-topic question, but outside of that <laughs> plus <laughs> Stop it, Anders. You said five to eight minutes. We are still in that zone. Who are uh, all of your favorite teams you support in another league that's not MLS, and not because they have former MLS players or USMNT players, but because you're just a fan? And they close with this. Doyle seems like he'd support Liverpool like myself. Oh mm. See, people it. are seeing you in themselves, Doyle. Yeah, you're you're just you're a brother in arms. You know, you'll never walk alone. You just arm in arm, man. Just you know, you know, red scarves on. You know, like the Mar- not you know, Mersey side, baby. Uh, it's you. No, I I I, I was always <laughs> partial to uh, to to Barcelona. Um, going back to to the mid '90s, you know the 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 first golden era for that team. Well, the the dream team and all that with with Cruyff and they, they, you know, they were an easy team to to sort of have an affinity for, given that um, Real Madrid are, are the Yankees. They're just gross. So I was I I drifted <laughs> towards towards uh, Barcelona from the off, and then. Them being the team that has been um, at the forefront of a lot of the uh, more aesthetically pleasing tactical initiatives over the past 30 years, uh, it made me like them even more. Though the only team that I really, really root for, like I, I, I like Barcelona, I, I would never call myself a fan. They're like, I, I wouldn't, yeah. Uh, the only team I really, really root for is Gotham FC. That, like, I, I watch them for fun. Dave, you have a team? I'm the one that asked the questions. Austin well, Trusting fine. fan over here. I, I don't have a team. I don't have a team. There was a there was a time, there was an era when You're I watched have a lot Matt of Arsenal. Turner and Austin Trusty. Yeah, no, no. That's true. That's true. Your favorite team of that's all true. time. That's true. Give me give me some give me some Austin Trusty uh, at the Emirates, baby. It was Arsenal. My brother liked liked Arsenal a lot, so it was a good way for he and I to connect. Uh, and I had a roommate. Uh, shout out to Clint. Who still remains obsessed, but I've removed any sense of <laughs> soccer pain from my life, and therefore Arsenal and the. Uh, I, honestly, I just watch MLS. I watch Americans abroad, and I don't have time or inclination to watch a ton of European soccer anymore. So big I, games, sure. Games every weekend, no. My answer would be I'm the in- opposite of Doyle. Uh, when I was in high school, I went and lived in in Spain for a summer and played soccer. My coach had played for Atletico Madrid. We were in Madrid. I got their jerseys. Fernando Torres was coming through uh, at that time into the Spanish national team. So I sort of found an affinity there. And um, the soccer style has changed. But there's probably nothing I wouldn't do if Diego Simeone walked up to me in an all-black suit and quietly whispered it in my ear. Know that. Because Diego (laughs) Simeone has full control over me. And when we were at MLS All-Star and I went to their training session, it was un real it was middle of the day orlando in preseason and he basically had all of the veterans pressing Zhao felix into the ground in a small-sided game for well, 75 minutes that tells you uh that tells you about what happened to Zhao felix uh, i let it go uh rodrigo in minnesota i have to get this in who scores more goals in 2022 for the loons amaria or hunu 
I trust I trust the underlying numbers. Who knows was who knows underlying numbers were really good last year. So I I, I think it's him. But Amaria uh, Amaria scored I mean, goals. It, it's a it's a it's a coin flip. It really is. Amaria was good uh, in that brief run he had a couple of years ago. Who does Adrian trust more? That's probably the better. Yeah, I think answer that's to that where question. you look at Huno. It's the DP. He spent the money. He's going to yep. give him every chance. To, Anything to else to uh, annoy Anders in the mailbag? Or are we getting no, out of here? I'm not going to do that to him. All right, we won't. We won't do it. Uh, big thanks to everybody who came on the show today. John Arnold, Robin Fraser, Wilfred Nance. Really enjoyed having all of them, having a little chat with them. Look out on your podcast feeds. Josie Althador, one v one, coming very very soon. We'll let you know on Twitter when it drops. Enjoy your week, everybody. We're almost there. CCL is here. Protect yourself. Gird your loins. We'll see you on Thursday.